Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Hello, my name is David Warren. I'm a senior vulnerability researcher here at the SEI. I'm sitting down today with Alan Householder, who is also a senior vulnerability researcher uh, at the SEI. And we're going to discuss the coordinated uh, vulnerability disclosure guide. Uh, Welcome, Alan. Thanks. So let's talk about a little bit of um, what it means to be a vulnerability researcher here at the SEI. Uh, Can you describe sort of how you came to work at CERT and um, what you do? Yeah. So uh, my background way back in the 90s was as a a network and web infrastructure engineer. Um, And I came into the CERT CC as a uh, incident analyst back around the time that Code Red and all the worms were hitting and uh, started getting involved in uh, some of the analysis of sort of how worms spread and how malware spreads and things, which led to uh, doing some work with the malware analysts. Um, and we did uh, worked on packer signatures and then malware trends across the uh, vulnerability, or I'm sorry, across the malware database. Um, and then eventually I wound up doing vulnerability analysis, um, in particular working on uh, the fuzzers that uh, CERT put out a few years ago. Um, and in the process of doing fuzzing, we discovered that uh, vulnerability disclosure was a big bottleneck because we could find lots of vulnerabilities, but we couldn't necessarily coordinate and get them fixed. Uh, fuzzers are really good at finding stuff. They're not so good at making people fix things. Um, and so that sparked my interest in coordinated disclosure. Uh, and then since then, I've kind of looked at started to take a broader look of at, at the ecosystem in which disclosure happens and all of those processes that, that go along with it. So uh, that brings us to today. I remember that. I, I worked on the fuzzing aspects with Alan, and I remember generating the thousands and thousands of crashing test cases that we would then send to a vendor, and then they would sort of have to ingest and deal with. And uh, sometimes they weren't as thankful as you would think for people that were doing uh, QA for them. Uh, but also it would lead to finding vulnerabilities in libraries that are used in lots of different software that you would need to coordinate with lots of different vendors, which right. led to coordinated vulnerability disclosure uh, situations that we had to sort of document and make policy. And exactly through that um, uh, experience is what sort of motivated the, the CVD guide. Yeah, and very very few software vendors are really happy when you say, here's 300 more things to put on your to-do list. Sure, absolutely. I mean, each one of those became a ticket in their bug tracker right. system that and a software engineer had to look at. And I, I sympathize with them that it was expensive. Uh, and they sort of, because they're security issues, they were sort of forced to look at them. Right. Uh, so yeah, so, so we sort of documented our process and uh, for other folks to follow um, and sort of as to sort of lay the groundwork for doing coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Uh, So let's talk about what coordinated vulnerability disclosure is. So what is it and why is it important? So basically it it all starts with somebody finds a vulnerability in a product or service um, and that might be as, you know, that might be because you've you've run a fuzzer and you found some result and you've determined that that that's likely to be exploitable. Uh, That could be because um, there have been vulnerabilities reported in like Xbox where uh, a little kid was just mashing the buttons on the controller and it turns out he was able to buy something through a store and there was you know there's vulnerability or something in the in this uh, the service um, so people can find vulnerabilities lots of different ways um, once you found a vulnerability now the world kind of divides into two groups there's the people who know about the vulnerability and the people and everyone else who doesn't so the question is for the people who know about the vulnerability that you have to start start from the standpoint of okay, what do I need to do about this? And who else needs to know? And what do they need to know about it? And when should we tell them? Um, And those, you kind of just iterate over those questions until the answers come back as there's nothing else to do. And uh, we've told everybody who needs to know to be able to do something to fix it. Uh, Usually that means researchers will tell the vendor or the service provider about the vulnerability. Uh, They'll work with them to, you know, to deal with, Here's what the problem is. Here's what the, we think the fix is. Uh, the vendor or whoever the responsible party is that can modify the, the software or the system to fix it does so. Uh, and then they 
the researcher may may check uh, to confirm that that's been fixed, and then there is a uh, process of sometimes that also results in the need for public disclosure where uh, there's something further that needs to be done. So if if a vendor of a shrink wrap product fixes something, uh, it might, it might also require the users to go patch and apply patches or something. Uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't always result in public disclosure because sometimes it's a service and you know if you report something to a service provider and they can just fix it and deploy that fix across all their systems there's really no user interaction there so uh, you may or may not need to uh, provoke provoke the end users to do something and in that case maybe public disclosure isn't the right thing but the coordination piece and then the disclosure piece you know disclosure happens in stages to different people and different parties at a time uh, so the disclosure piece doesn't necessarily mean publication but sometimes it does. Uh, it definitely means telling the people who who are most likely to be able to fix the problem and making sure and getting them to the point of, of actually fixing the problems. So you're optimizing for societal good, if possible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's it, you're trying trying to get problems fixed before they become actual problems. Uh, you know, all, obviously vulnerabilities are situations where. People are ex- uh, systems are exploitable by adversaries, uh, and you'd like to be able to get those fixes deployed to all of the affected systems as quickly as you can, so that there's less opportunity for adversaries to to leverage those and do whatever it is they do. So minimizing the window for attacks. Right. Yeah. Great. So um, so to that end, uh, CERT has released the actual guide to coordinated disclosure. Uh, so would you like to go into sort of the, the background of the original guide and then so um, and then how it's been used since the initial publication? Yeah, so CERT has been doing vulnerability coordination since uh, just about 1988 when it was formed. Uh, one of the very first CERT, of, in fact, I think the first CERT advisory was an FTP vulnerability advisory uh, in December of 1988. Um, Stack and, buffer overflow, I would guess. Probably. Almost undoubtedly yeah. because that's, you know. Yep. In, in recent years, we've we've shifted from, you know, coordinating all the vulnerabilities for the entire internet to, you know, shifting down towards taking the big ones to taking the ones that are multi-party because, you know, at CERT, the, the internet has grown a lot faster than CERT has, uh, and our our group hasn't is about the same size that it was back in the 90s. Um, different people, of course, but uh, there's, uh, there's still a need for some degree of, of coordinated disclosure uh, in which you know CERT gets involved uh, from time to time. Our guide came up because we realized that more people were needing to do disclosure and coordinate disclosures. And not, it's not just software vendors. Uh, it also is government agencies um, and any, any manufacturer now that has some smart component or IoT device, uh, car manufacturers. Um, and it plays a Help. role in like bug bounty brokers too, like the right. hacker ones. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. So there's people who provide those services now too, mm-hmm. and uh, they're all getting into this co- this disclosure uh, process. And we realize that there's a lot of people that could benefit from the advice we have just based on our experience. So this the guide actually started as uh, a, b- a bunch of the vulnerability analysts that start sitting around a table for a few hours, and I, I basically said, okay, let's just talk about everything that goes wrong in coordinated disclosure land. Um, and we, we sat there for a few hours and I just took pages and pages of notes on, you know, this goes wrong and that goes wrong and there's all, all these problems that come up. And then we started, that sort of served the, as the basis of, well, how can we help people avoid those problems when they come up? And they've happened enough that, uh, you know, we've seen it repeatedly. So let's, let's tell people, you should expect to run into these problems and here's what you do about those problems when they come up. And I think you've had some experience uh, with, uh, some safety-related product vendors who've who've kind of gone through this process of coming up to speed on things. You want to right? Yeah. That so I mean, uh, doing vulnerability research, you find vulnerabilities and you report them to the vendor. And sometimes it goes very smoothly, but sometimes it also can go uh, a bit poorly. And generally, that stems from mismatched expectations about the process. Right. So. Uh, as a researcher, you come with the expectation that a particular vulnerability may be um, assigned a CVE uh, and disclosed eventually uh, after being patched, of course. Um, but the vendor may come with different expectations uh, or a 
misunderstanding of um, sort of the standard operating procedures for doing coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And I think that was part of the motivation of the guide was that you can point to something that uh, can help uh, vendors, but also researchers, uh, come to the table with sort of a common understanding of what the process and terminology is going to look like. Um, and yeah, so we've had instances where vendors have pushed back a lot, and the, being able to cite the, uh, the CVD guide as a resource for how the process should play out uh, has been very helpful. Yeah, we've also seen it play out in, uh, in, in some strange ways. Uh, or unexpected ways, I guess, and not necessarily strange. Um, back about a year ago, uh, when uh, I guess it was in twenty yeah twenty eighteen, when Meltdown Inspector, uh, the, when those vulnerabilities came out over the over the holiday season, um, there was a lot of concern all the way up into the government about how that how those vulnerabilities were communicated to the vendors and to parties. Uh, in critical infrastructure and the government and, and uh, all sorts of stakeholders um, to the point that there were congressional hearings about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the response, for the, so I think Intel and Apple and Google and Microsoft and I'm f ARM and I'm forgetting a couple other vendors um, were, were basically inquired, uh, Congress inquired them about how they handled this, that disclosure. And uh, in their responses, some of those vendors actually cited our guide as, well, this is how we do this, um, which was a real, it was a nice endorsement for us, you know, that we had uh, gotten the attention of those vendors and that they had noticed, noticed that, like, this is a good framework for which to do this. And uh, later on in that year, in 2018, there were uh, congressional hearings, at, at our Senate hearings, um, at which uh, Art Mannion, our colleague, t uh, testified regarding the disclosure of Meltdown Inspector and in particular coordinated disclosure and how, how that can help uh, protect you know, critical infrastructures in the nation and, and around the world. Um, and as a result of that, we actually got feedback from uh, the House and Senate, the, the joint House and Senate committees that had uh, sent out those inquiries and also held the, the hearings. Uh, providing us with feedback on our guide. So there's actually in the in the latest version of the guide, there's you know a section in there that's prompted by congressional staffers and Senate staffers, uh, providing us the, that feedback from you know from their committees. Um, it's not not wasn't quite the audience we thought we were going for with this, with <laughs> this guide, feedback. but it, but it was neat to be able to interact you know at that level of of government where they're they're telling us you know we want we want this guide to say this and you know, we had some back and forth and we, we made some updates based on that feedback. And that's an important point is that the guide is a living document. Um, and so we're incorporating feedback from others into it as uh, we receive it and sort of are tweaking it for uh, different processes. Um, and so we've made, uh, let's see, it's a wiki now is the best place for people to find it. Right. So the, the original version of the guide we put out in 2017 was a PDF file. Uh, just a, a giant report. Uh, I think it came in over to 120 pages. Um, and as a lot of folks noticed, 120 pages is a, a lot, lot to get through. Yeah, it's a lot to digest. Um, and so we heard that, but we also realized that the reason it was 120 pages was because we had a hard time saying it in in fewer words because uh, there's a lot to a there are lot, a lot to of get corner through. cases in this right. process. And and again, because it, because it originated as a you know enumerate everything that goes wrong and then try to provide advice to how to fix for how to fix that. Um, we had a hard time collapsing it down. But what we did was we turned it into a, uh, a wiki that we can now edit and revise as needed. Um, so that was the first major improvement was just getting the content out of the static PDF file and into a wiki that we can dynamically edit. Um, it also the, pairs down sort of the size shock or length shock of what you're looking at, right? So you're not looking at a 120 page document anymore. You're looking at one specific wiki page, which right. details one aspect of it. Right. And the executive summary is a page in the wiki, Yes, I believe. So in fact, you can go print out the executive summary just yeah. by itself and start with that. Yep. It also now links into all of the other sections. So it's, you know, uh, you can, you can hop to directly with the parts that you need. Yeah. So that's a great starting point for vendors and researchers if they just want to 
figure out the gist of it and then drill down to the sections that they may be having problems with, which includes right. a troubleshooting guide too, I believe. Right. Uh, there's a one of the one of the things we we noticed was uh, on you know we follow a bunch of security researchers on Twitter, and occasionally they will comment about. I reported this vulnerability to this vendor, and they're having some problem with the coordination or problems with getting the vendor to pay attention to them or whatever the issues are. Um, and so we've just from watching that, we realized, oh, there's a, there's a lot of edge cases that we actually didn't capture because we captured all of the all of the problems that occur from a coordinator's perspective, but we didn't really have the researcher's perspective quite as fleshed out as because we're you know we're not we're not really playing in that in the researcher to vendor space directly so much. We're more in the, the coordinator space. Um, but from observing that, we realize, oh, there's more things we could put in here. So, And I just want to interject here. Sure. Generally, when we do interact as the researcher, when we discover something and we're talking to a vendor, we have the benefit of being at CERT to back us up when right. we're talking to vendors, which um, which is, is a good token to have. And a lot of researchers don't have that. They're just a lonely researcher that's doesn't have an organization sort of backing them, which makes it more difficult for them in some instances. Right. Um, and and I think we even mentioned in the guide in the troubleshooting section, like if you can't contact the vendor or the vendor dismisses the vulnerability and says that they're, it's not a vulnerability and that they're not going to do anything or address it, right. that um, sometimes uh, disclosure, uh, public disclosure, even without the vendor's necessarily coordinated uh, coordination, if you've done a good faith uh, effort to um, sort of tell them about the vulnerability, uh, that that's one out from the guide, right. which is a bit more of like unilateral vulnerability disclosure than coordinated. But, um, you know, it's one aspect of the troubleshooting of all of this um, that, that sort of when you're optimizing for societal good, sometimes that is the answer. Right. So the, the troubleshooting table, in, or the, the troubleshooting guide in particular is just a, a small section within the overall guide. But it's to me, I think it's probably the the most the highest impact think change that we've made to the guide since its original publication, um, and the idea from that really came from if you look in the if you buy an appliance like a washing machine or something, you look in the look in the manual in the back there is a uh, there's usually a table that says uh, if you have this problem then do this uh, you know so if the uh, if the if the washer is beeping uh, and there's a certain code on the display, it means that the load's unbalanced, and it's, a different code means that the belt needs to be replaced or whatever. There's you know there's a lot of different troubleshooting steps, um, but it's really problem oriented. Where you know you have this problem, here's the situation, here's how to recognize whether that's really the problem you have, and then what should you do about it. So we we built this table that starts off with uh, you know a, a brief description of the problem. Uh, it also explains or includes, you know, which roles within the coordinated disclosure are likely to experience this problem, whether that's the researcher, the reporter, um, the uh, the vendor or coordinator, and sometimes it's multiple of those that, that might be affected. And also which phase of the coordinated disclosure does that tend to occur in, whether it's uh, from discovery through uh, initial validation and triage of the report all the way through you know, getting the patches produced to deploying them uh, or, or communicating the need for that deployment. Uh, so we have a, there's a long list of, of issues we've seen, some of which are you know, things that we thought of after we published the guide originally. Some of them are clarifications of things that we said in the guide um, and based on observing people's reaction to the guide, we were able to say, oh, we didn't quite say that. There, people are interpreting it slightly differently than what we intended, so here's, our, here's a clarified interpretation of it. And sometimes it was just based on those, you know, uh, the Twitter threads where someone said, someone was complaining about something, and we're like, yeah, we have something to say about that. So we just added those in as well. Right, so how do people provide and feedback? Uh, do they tweet at you? So now that, it, can, but, now that uh, it's a wiki, we have mm -hmm. a we also have links uh, on every page in the sidebar. There's a link that says suggest a change. Mm -hmm. uh, that leads to a GitHub project. Um, the project itself doesn't have any content in it. The content's all in the wiki, but the you can you can submit issues uh, directly in that, and we can uh, have conversations in public about you know here's what we think the guide should say, and we can you know go back and forth on on those issues. And so that wiki, we'll have links to it in the transcript of yes. the podcast, but uh, that wiki is vols.cert.org? Yes. The, so vols.cert.org is the uh, general wiki. Uh, the CVD guide is a section of that wiki. So if you go to the vols.cert.org homepage, there's a C, uh, CERT guide to coordinated disclosure link from that page, which will take you into the guide. 
um, from there. There's, a, there's some other advice like how to report vols to CERT and some specific things for us uh, interacting with researchers and vendors as well. Mm -hmm. And if I can plug the wiki, the vols.cert.org wiki has other information such as a table for um, speculative execution vulnerabilities and a list of mitigations and alerts and stuff. As the list of those grows, um, we've sort of aggregated information uh, about that those that class of vulnerabilities right. uh, on vols.cert.org. So just I'm going to plug that real quick. Sure. So a couple other uh, changes we made to the guide as we after we got it into the wiki as well I wanted to mention. Um, the new version also has uh, information on how to find vendor contacts. We've had uh, a lot of folks reported, you know, that they don't. If the vendor doesn't already have information posted, which we recommend that vendors do, uh, how do you find vendor contacts? And we've we've done everything from uh, looking them up, you know, googling for security at or or other email addresses, looking for the. Uh, security.txt file, uh, which is based on an RFC recommendation. Um, but we've also done things like find the, co find the corporate officers in LexisNexis and then uh, figure out who has, who's likely to be a technical officer of the company and then send them registered mail mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes that's how you have to get the message through because you can't find a good, good point of contact. Um, you know, and it depends on how, how much effort you're willing to put into it. And you know, one of the things that's also in this troubleshooting guide is no one, no researcher is obligated to do any of this. Like, if you, if all you want to do is just get it fixed, send it the best way you know how. Make a good, make a good effort, and then you know you can walk away from it. You can publish it yourself. If you know, hopefully you've notified the vendor or made a good faith attempt to notify the vendor. You can contact us, and maybe we can help you find a contact. Uh, there's other organizations and, and groups around the world that that do coordinated disclosure as well. Um, Lots of national C certs are starting to build their capabilities there, so you can report to them, um, depending on which country you're in and and, and your affiliations there. Um, so to that end, we also included a little bit more explanation of like when and why you might engage a coordinator as opposed to just reporting to a vendor. So if right. you're so if that's you're a, a good question. Right. So if I'm a researcher, I find a vulnerability. Why should I come to a coordinator such as cert as opposed to just going straight to the vendor myself? Right. So if the vendor has has available and easy to find contact information, and they have a reputation for treating uh, treating researchers well, and they you know uh, and basically they're they they appear to be willing to receive those reports, uh, you probably don't need us and just go to you know, report the vols directly to the vendors. Most big vendors are pretty good about this at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, at least traditional the software industry vendors. Industry is maturing. Yeah, and yeah. and and lots of uh, cloud vendors and, <laughs> and service providers also are are pretty good at recognizing the need for this. Um, where we've seen it more recently, sort of our focus has shifted into the problem cases, and the problem cases tend to be, arise not so much on traditional IT vendors, but more in the uh, companies that that used to build you know, mechanical products or durable goods or those mm -hmm. sorts of things. And now they have an IoT component mm -hmm. to their thing. So uh, it's a refrigerator or a car or a washing machine um, an or, IoT or an industrial control system or a medical device or an airplane. Right. Um, and to be clear, it's not all of these companies. Some no. of them are some some, some of, them, of are, them are well uh, right. versed in coordinated vulnerability disclosure, but some especially the new ones that, you know, Right. They didn't even live that much in computer land, and they have a couple of embedded engineers, and now all of a sudden they have to yeah. swim in this pool of coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And a, and a few years ago, those companies were kind of surprised to find out that they were computer companies or they were software right. companies. Um, I don't think, I don't think it, many of them have that carry that illusion anymore that they're not. Um, but they also still haven't really ramped up uh, quite as much in those industries as as like the IT industry has. Uh, to recognize the need to be able to receive reports and deal with those things. So, if a reporter, if a researcher can't find uh, a contact, or if they've made contact but they've gotten a really hostile response, or they've gotten some, uh, you know, some negative response from the vendor, uh, we will help, uh, and and lots of other coordinators will often help, uh, sort of smooth that over and can act as a neutral third party to say, you know, is it really a vulnerability? Is it important? And you know, some of that helps with uh, taking some of the weight off the researcher to justify to them, justify to the vendor. No, I'm not really trying to hack your systems. I'm not trying to destroy you. Um, I'm just trying to point out that hey, you have a problem. You know, it's, it's almost the equivalent of like your shoes are untied, um, and I thought you might like to know. Um, 
we can help them through that. And some of that is also, in, you know, encapsulated in the guide. So we can just we can contact a vendor, say this person's trying to trying to do this thing with you. And here's a guide that explains what they're trying to do and why you you know, why you might want to treat them nicely because they're actually your friend. They're not your enemy. Right. And I think another category of that of the um, time when you might want to engage a coordinator is when you find a vulnerability in some component that is used uh, in like thousands of products or something. So uh, all of a sudden the workload for you as a researcher goes from a one-to-one -one conversation with a vendor to, oh, I have found something in a library or some subcomponent of something that's used across the industry. And ideally the person that sort of uh, wrote that library would be the one to step in and coordinate it. But even the workload for that can be tremendous. Right. Uh, and so that may be a time when people would want to engage a, um, a coordinator. Right. So vulnerabilities can occur anywhere along the supply chain uh, from, from the library standpoint and also even in the hardware component standpoint. Meltdown Inspector are a classic example. Uh, in fact, probably they're, they're probably the, the most prominent example that I can think of of a hardware problem where, yes, there's really one vendor or a couple of vendors, you know, the CPU manufacturer vendors um, are the ones that are best placed to f actually fix the problem. But CPUs and operating systems intermix so much, you know, that, that there's there are things you can do in the operating system that, that can address problems in the CPU and vice versa. Um, so in situations like that, you wind up with uh, it is that multi-party coordination process, and that's really where multi, the multi-party coordination thing uh, got a lot of attention was because of um, a lot of those vendors were kind of new to that process. Uh, you know, the Googles and Microsofts and Apples were mostly used to fixing their own problems in their own software, uh, but when it comes to, oh, I know about a problem and it affects me, but it also affects you, uh, and we both need to do something in order to fix it. And Oh, there's also 20 other people or 20 other vendors out there that also need to do something. Right. Um, or the least cost avoider fix could be right. in an OS manufacturer as opposed to a hardware manufacturer. Right. And then some of those changes also affect downstream now. So, you know, if you change change something that happens in the OS, uh, be, as a result of the hardware problem, you change something in the OS, and now an API changes that's that your downstream uh, application vendors were using, you have to coordinate with them too. And that you know, so that that supply chain process, or supply chain as as a way of thinking about how to co where the coordination goes, um, becomes really important. And supply chains are not easy easily mapped, uh, and that, that gets into a lot of complexity in terms of just how software is made. Right. Yeah. These cases can get incredibly complex. Right. Uh, yeah. And we've seen a couple recently, uh, such as the speculative execution uh, set of vulnerabilities. Yeah, and that's not that's not new. Um, we've you know, we had a we had a situation. Oh, the Kaminsky vol uh, in two thousand nine. Two thousand eight, two thousand nine. There was a DNS yeah. vol. Um, there was an SNMP vulnerability back in two thousand one or two thousand two, um, and at the at that time, that was like the largest vulnerability we'd ever coordinated in ter in terms of effort. I mean, I think we had eight or no, eight or ten thousand email messages uh, back and forth between us and all of the vendors, um, and it that was one of those things where. Every network vendor, every operating system vendor, anybody who made anything that talked TCP/IP probably had an SNMP client that they needed to fix. Um, and yeah, so there, yeah, know, the protocol <clears throat> or spec vulnerabilities are always tricky. Yeah, the deep, the mm -hmm. deeper it is in the embedded in the system, the the harder it is to get it fixed because there's a lot more coordination because lots of people have to do something. So uh, switching gears a little bit, so we have recently published uh, vol disclosure policy templates. Do you want to talk uh, briefly about what a vol disclosure policy template is and then how people could use it uh, in their companies or as researchers? Sure. So we've had to review uh, a lot of organizations' uh, vulnerability disclosure policies. Um, and sometimes that's because our government sponsors have asked us to review their, their own agency's uh, policies. Sometimes that's because we've been asked to develop policies that or develop text that can go into their policies. Um, and we've also been involved in um, uh, sort of multi-stakeholder processes with uh, out of uh, and the NTIA groups uh, in vulnerability disclosure a few years ago, as well as some industry standards organizations. Uh, there's some work in ISO uh, for vulnerability disclosure. Uh, there's also been some other 
sort of uh, collaborative efforts about vulnerability disclosure. And what we've realized is most of these policies are saying almost the same thing. They're sometimes using different words, and sometimes they're some policies are you know addressing some a, some aspects, but they're missing other things that we think are important. Uh, so we put out a set of templates that are really intended for it's not it's not that you can just take this poli- take this document and turn it into your policy it's that this pol- this is a document that has a list of statements that you might want to include you should evaluate them individually and like pick the ones you want pick the ones that make sense for you um, can you give me an example of some of those so statements? like if you're going to re- if you're a researcher and you're reporting a vulnerability to an organization uh, you probably would prefer it if the organization didn't require you to be a customer and have a customer agreement before you could report things because, you know, I'm just a random guy off the street that noticed something and I want to tell you about it. I don't have a customer ID. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's a a statement in there to that effect that, you know, organizations shouldn't require shouldn't require researchers to um, to be customers in order to report vulnerabilities. There are things like uh, researchers should keep that keep what their, their findings private uh, for whatever duration it takes, uh, either some specific you know, time frame like 45 days or 90 days depending on your policy, or maybe it's until the problem is fixed uh, and the fix can be confirmed. Um, there are- So people are gonna have to tweak it for their individual Yeah, and, and, and we, we wrote it- we wrote it with like RFC style language with, you know, the musts and mm-hmm. the shoulds and the shalls and whatever, uh, mostly because that lets us be very succinct and clear. And, you know, these are single bullet points where each one makes exactly one statement about an expectation that either a researcher or an organization, you know, a vendor should have or, or may have uh, of the other party. Um, and you kind of go, you know, the idea for using this would be you go through that list, pick out the ones that make sense to you, and if it's, you know, you can tweak the wording. If it says, if ours says must and you think it should be a may, you know, fine, do that. Mm-hmm. You know, what, but just try to be a little more consistent in what things you're addressing. Um, and Which also again, helps vendors and researchers be on the same page as far as what's right. going to happen. Yeah, because right? most most of most of the problems we run into with vulnerability disclosure tend to be because of mismatched. Uh, expectations. expectations. Yeah. So this is really about helping to nail down those expectations of researchers can expect organizations to behave this this way, and organizations can expect researchers to behave in a certain way, and they can articulate that in in you know some somewhat of a common language uh, using the the templates we've put out. Um, the the whole point of that is, you know, currently there's a um, uh, a request out from uh, Office of Management and Budget for a potential ruling or a potential uh, binding operational directive to go to all the government agencies saying that, you know, government agencies will have a, a vulnerability disclosure policy, um, which means there's going to be a lot of agencies out there that need to write policies. Each agency will have its Each own. agency will have its mm-hmm. own policy. Um, and they're all going to need to do that in 2020 if that directive, you know, becomes actual fact. Um, so we thought... It'd be a good idea, given that we've done this enough times, we should just put some words out there that can serve as a starting point for those those agencies, but also for, uh, you know, vendors companies, yeah. or companies or service providers, or for, for that matter, researchers. I mean, a researcher may want to mm-hmm. have an indiv- individual disclosure policy that here's how you can expect me to behave, mm-hmm. and they can be declarative about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately, being declarative about this is good because it sets the expectations and it avoids the uncertainty, and that, that really is, you know, the place where problems arise is when there's un- uncertainty in the process. Well, great. Uh, Alan, uh, thank you for taking time to talk with us today. Uh, the links okay. for everything we talked about will be in the transcript. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at Info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.